Our next speaker uh, is Bonita Bennett. While well, talking about difficult pasts, she's from South Africa and she's the, the director of the District 6 Museum. Um, and uh, she identifies herself as an educator with strong anti-apartheid activist roots. Um, and she, she studied at the University of Cape Town and currently registered as a doctoral student um, at the University of Pretoria. Uh, both of her parents are from District 6, um, and she grew up in a township on the Cape Flats with other families who were displaced. And today she's going to present uh, a talk titled Memory is the Weapon. Please, Bonita. Good morning, and thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you also to, for this invitation. I bring you particularly to the Randing Foundation. Um, greetings of friendship and solidarity from the District 6 Museum, from our staff and community and our trustees. And we are very thankful for Niat's very hard work of creating friends across the world. And we consider ourselves to be a, a friend of the foundation. So thank you for including us in this, in this conference. And I think maybe you might be asking yourself, what is memory a weapon against or for? And I apologize for the slightly violent kind of metaphor of being a weapon. But I hope that by the end of my talk, you will have a good sense of what I mean by that. And memory is a weapon is the name of an autobiography of one of South Africa's great writers, Don Matera, and I've borrowed his title believing it to be very apt for this, for this reflection. And I'll be talking very broadly. It's about, I've, I've interpreted exhibiting difficult pasts in a very broad sense. So it's not really about exhibitions in our museum, but it's more about how we embody and engage with this difficult past in the work that we do. In Don Matera's autobiography, he narrates in very powerful detail his family's experience of being forcibly removed from Sophia Town in another part of our country as a result of the Group Areas Act under apartheid. This was the same law under which District 6 was declared a white group area in 1966. And I just want to acknowledge my use of his title. Very briefly, I want to tell you about where District 6 is. So that's Cape Town. Um, this is the picture that we love to show the tourists. <laughs> Lovely aerial photograph of a beautiful city with all its complexities and right at the southernmost tip of Africa. The blue circle to your right is more or less where District 6, that's Cape Town, and the neighborhood that was known as District 6 on the lower slopes of Table Mountain, that's more or less where it is located. It was an inner city neighborhood which existed from the late 1800s. And who were the people who lived in District 6? It was a very vibrant community consisting of people from all different places, language groups. Um, they consisted of indigenous people living in the area. They were the freed slaves. Slavery, um, the enslaved people at the Cape were freed in 1834. And they came from Indonesia, from Java, from Mozambique from India, from Angola. So in themselves, what we talk about the enslaved, the freed enslaved people, they were obviously not homogenous. They also already come with all that diversity as well. There were the Jews that were fleeing the, the, the pogroms in Eastern Europe, particularly Lithuania and Latvia that landed up in District 6. And there were also immigrants from other parts of Europe coming to live there and entering the port city through the Table Bay Harbor. It had all the vibrancy and the creativity, I believe, of port cities like Shanghai, New Orleans, like Rio de Janeiro, amongst others. And it was known for its celebration of life, for its love of difference and diversity. And it was an energetic hub of the city, even to people who did not live there. So these are just some, a few images of the neighborhood. As you can see, an inner city neighborhood, a little bit of crumbling, but definitely an area that had a sense of permanence about it. So when the apartheid government came into power in 1948, District 6 became one of its many targets of destruction because of its clear message that social cohesion was possible and desirable. It showed people that diversity and difference wasn't something to be feared. 
when people in all their glorious differences could come together in the correct spirit, a community could be made. And this was not the message that the apartheid government wanted people to be exposed to, as they needed wholesale belief in their political ideology based on divide and rule. District 6 was declared a white group area under the Group Areas Act of 1950, and the area was gradually destroyed, being described as a slum by the apartheid government. People were given racial identities according to the Population Registration Act and given identity cards coded with the racial classification, and they were also sent to different areas allocated to them on the basis of the Group Areas Act, also of 1950. There was, much, there was some resistance, quite a bit of resistance to the forced removals, but not all of it was, e was effective, and the government managed to, over a period of about 15 years, gradually destroy the community, uh, um, bulldozing the houses, and creating uh, the flattened landscape that was meant to be resurrected as a white c community um, for people who were classified by, by, as white people in South Africa. And although the resistance continued, it was not so successful in stopping the destruction, but it was more successful really in preventing the apartheid dream of the white neighborhood from being developed on the area. And so the landscape remained pretty much unoccupied because of the campaign um, until the period that we now call the New South Africa where restitution is possible. So, just coming to now to the role of museums. So thinking about how this museum becomes a tool for resistance when in apartheid South Africa, museums were not known for their transformative role. Even when they did not make overt um, arguments and explicit arguments for the existence of racial oppression, the acceptance of the racial classification in the curatorial framework certainly contributed to a normalization of these racial categories and became part of South Africa's hidden curriculum. One example in Cape Town is that the history of white South Africans was to be found interpreted in the Cultural History Museum in our city, while the history of indigenous black people was to be found in the Nat Nat Natural History Museum alongside the depiction of the country's rich plant and animal life. And that's just one example of a diorama that no longer exists but that caused quite a lot of controversy um, where people were, as you can see, exhibited behind those cases. So that's a, an image of the District 6 Museum um, doing something that is probably not, at the time, traditional museum practice, but it's holding a, ma a mass meeting of the former residents of District 6 where are they coming to find out about the Land Restitution Act and the ability to claim their right to return to the land from which they were forcibly removed. So we viewed within its historical context the creation of a, me of a museum as a vehicle for advocating for social justice and a site of transformation might have seemed counterintuitive at the time given the examples that existed in South Africa of what a museum was and could be. The decision to start the District 6 Museum in the 1980s, and that is still in the tail end of apartheid, um, has been the subject of many debates and discussions. And it was made at a time when museums were clearly associated with the country's colonial past and the maintenance of the status quo in South Africa. And there was no local precedent of the museum, of a museum that was at the forefront of change. At that time, South African museums had been largely untouched by the new museology movement that had started across the world in the 1970s, with museums responding to critiques of being a waste of public money and being exclusive and disconnected from people. Museums had been experienced in black, by black South Africans largely as places of exclusion and where representation provided the rationale for inequality. They were not friendly or engaging spaces. In 1989, there was a campaign called the Hands of District 6 campaign, which was a coming together of organizations and individuals were committed to change and really as part of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. There was a, a conference in 1989, and at this conference, there was a decision made or call for this place of memory 
and many people speak of the birth of the District 6 Museum being at, as that place in 1989. It existed as a movement with no building, with no exhibition, with no permanent place from 1989 till 1994 when it birthed itself as a museum with a building and with walls. And many people who attended the conference talk about two significant decisions that, the, that were made at, at that place. The one was that all development and all discussions about the development of District 6, not the museum, the District 6 land, was to be done in the context of creating a new democratic South Africa. So any development that did not include the people was, not, was declared to be taking place on hallowed ground or salted earth and that was not to be supported by the Hands Off District 6 campaign. And the second decision was, of course, the creation of the District 6 Museum. And reflecting on what was foremost in the thinking when coming to such a decision, conference attendees are unanimous in the accounts of, the, of what the museum was meant to achieve. One founder member, the late Irvin Combrink, speaks of enthusiastically allying, our, allying ourselves to the idea of a museum or a center for community and history. This would not be the type of museum, he said, that exhibited the historic accomplishments of a privileged section. It would be a living people's place where the people's history could be recorded. Another trustee says, a memory I have about the origins of the museum is the capacity it had first as an idea and later as an organization to engineer a collective spirit and camaraderie among all who were involved with it. The capacity to inspire a shared purpose had as much to do with the prevailing political situation we found ourselves in during the late 1980s and early 1990s as it had to do with the memory of District 6 itself. For many of us, this collective spirit was stimulated during the Hands of District 6 campaign and the period of heady protest politics. In other words, it was thought of as a weapon from the start. In less violent terms, rather a vehicle for social change, particularly reclamation of land and of home, and advocating the role that memory could play in such reclamation, particularly in the context of people whose stories had been excluded from the, from the official history of the country. The writing of people like Don Matera and institutions like the District 6 Museum and others form part of the movement to reclaim history. The memorabilia that people brought to the museum to build its archive and its story, the bits and pieces of their pasts, the broken shards of pottery, the keys to doors that no longer existed, are at the core of the District 6 Museum collection. With the material traces of their lives, their streets, their homes, other points of reference having been erased, the retained fragments of that remembered time became elevated in value, representing the evidence of having lived in a place even as the denuded landscape failed to retain any material acknowledgement that they were there. Amongst these were identity documents of various kinds. There were also um, family albums, newspaper clippings, birth certificates, all of those important documents that some people kept and interestingly, many people actually left behind because they never believed that they would ever be returning and that they would ever need them again. So developing strategies which are inclusive are crucial but not, su not sufficient. They need to be effective as well and that is what the District 6 Museum tries very hard to do in its work Sorry, I'm going the wrong way, I think. I'm sorry, something's happened to my presentation. <laughs> but um, I'm sorry about that. The other slides seem to be next. Okay, I'm sorry about that. The second part of the presentation seems to be missing. <laughs> oh, so that's, that's, that's fine.
Yeah, ah, two. thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I think there are too many things for me to, to focus on. I'm looking at the time and my paper. Well, and don't the... worry about the time. <laughs> I'm looking at that. Don't worry about it's the like, time. You and... yes, um, right? Is it 17? You, it can okay. stay there. Yeah, thanks. So those are just some images that really as backdrop. So um, in, to give an idea of some of the strategies that the museum uses to both kind of build the knowledge of the community and involve people as well in the curation of the work as well. Um, so talking about how this participation is built, they, we find that the knowledge that people bring to, the, to their own history and, and creating the platforms for, for doing that is a very empowering process for people and this kind of inclusivity is at the heart of the museum's work. Having been at the core of its formation, it continues to be an important driver, even in a new form. The oral narrations, moving physical bodies through the space, um, those traumatized spaces that in the past represented displacement, but now they represent a new kind of return. Using tactility, working with the arts, all of these form the main strategies that the museum work, uses to do its work. And human rights, of course, is always um, at the center of what we do, in the, particularly in the context of restitution. We are committed to critiquing the sometimes limited understanding of human rights, which located almost entirely within the legal and policy framework. The difference between human rights as legislated and human rights as experienced by people is sometimes large and seemingly contradictory. Museums should be those places of dialogue where these questions of rights and humanity should be foregrounded and when exploration of possible answers can take place. They should strive to be places where the intersection between legal rights, social, cultural and personal rights can be explored and understood. So I hope I'm going to get the order right now. I just wanted to flip very quickly through some of the work that the muse museum does within the space. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, was, I thought it was going back, but I think I just went forward again. <laughs> Forgive me, but I'll just tell you in, in order. So that is, that is one of the... We do lots of processional work, work on the site, taking people into the spaces. And those are people who were part of a procession on a day of commemoration. We've created street signs, walking through the neighborhood with the signs of the streets where they used to live and standing then in an active display on the street. I'm going to go, just forgive me for this. Um, that's a performance that was happening also as part of the uh, Walk of Remembrance, where as part of the intergenerational exchange, young performers immersed themselves into the archive, developed a piece that moved through the site, and walked with the former residents in this performance, taking them to the site of displacement. It's part of the same performance. These are people who are pinning their wishes and dreams to a temporary wall that was created in the former District 6, um, which is now the site of a local university. And they just also, this was part of their attempt to remind the present um, residents at the site who are students from different parts of the country um, what their connection to the site was. So it's always trying to make that connection. Those are some of them just in, in a discussion forum, storytelling guides taking people through the museum. And this is one of the, the proud moments of creating a mural in studio based also on archive and um, current understandings of what was happening on the site. And some of the elderly people actually getting up on the scaffolding and, and doing the, installing the mural themselves. So all of this takes place then in the context of the rebuilding of District 6, and that is the site to which people are being returned to. Those are the new homes being built. And so all of the work that we're doing with arts, with site installations, is an exploration of how does one 
build this memory work into a traumatized site with a returning community of new and current generations as well. And so I'd like to think that the muse our museum tells a story of how a place traditionally known for telling a story of the past can become a place where pastness is the inspiration for struggling with contemporary issues. It is a place where many enter as observers and remain either as active participants or activators for change. I think that in being a place for transformation and thinking of ourselves as educating the public, museums themselves should be open to, tran to transforming themselves and being educated by the public as well. Thank you. Got that right.